Hi, my name is Julie Gritzmacher. I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy and Population Health Initiatives at Prevent Blindness. And today we are talking about inherited retinal diseases, specifically retinitis pigmentosa, RP. And I am joined by Brenda Nickham. Brenda, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, as Julie said, I'm Brenda Nickham. I'm the Information and Referral Coordinator at the League of Blind and Disabled and a Certified ADA Coordinator, and I also have RP. Brenda, thank you for joining us today and sharing your story. Retinitis pigmentosa, or RP, is one of many inherited retinal diseases. As someone with RP, can you tell us a little bit about what that is? It is a deterioration of the rods and cones in the retina. Um, for me, you know, you said inherited, and in my family, um, the furthest I know back was my great grandfather. My grandmother was a carrier. Her oldest was a son, so my dad has it. And um, for some reason, it decided, even though I was female, I, I ended up having it. So um, it's just kind of hit and miss in our family. My cousin also has it. And so um, it affects my night vision and my peripheral vision. So I have decent central vision with some blind spots, but walking out into the daylight is like an, uh, another person walking out from a movie theater out into the sunlight. So it's very bright. And the same uh, walking into an environment that is what might be normal for some feels like low light for me and like walking into a movie theater. So that's the best analogy I can give for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And and so with the family history, I imagine, um, you know, there must have been conversations with your family about the potential of, of you, you know, getting RP. Um, mm -hmm. But when did you first realize that um, something was different about your vision and, and how did you get your vision diagnosis? Well, I actually started wearing glasses at age two and um, I obviously didn't understand what RP was then. I just knew I wore glasses. So as I grew up, you know, um, young children are not always aware of what the adults are worried about. and I knew that when I went with my friends um, to do things, they would play baseball in the dark and uh, different activities, running and playing tag. And I, I said, yeah, this is not for me. I don't feel safe. Uh, but I just assumed that people who wore glasses couldn't see in the dark. So, you know, I didn't really bring that to my parents' attention. They were you know, when I had doctor's appointments, they were always asking for signs, um, but it wasn't until uh, I was in my mid-30s before I was diagnosed. So, you know, I had a, a strong astigmatism and being nearsighted as well, so that kind of added to it, but um, growing up, there were never any signs. We we checked frequently. In my teenage years, I started to understand a little bit more, um, saw how my dad struggled and um, when he stopped driving and uh, still was astonished at the amount of things that he could do with the amount of vision loss he had. But so, yeah, that's that's kind of growing up. That's kind of how it was. I didn't really fully understand it until my teenage years. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you said you were diagnosed in your 30s when when you received that diagnos diagnosis. How um, how was that experience for you? What was your reaction? Did it was a, a surprise? A little bit, just because it was assumed that since my parents had girls that, you know, it had been dominant in males and uh, we thought we were safe so to hear that diagnosis was kind of devastating and I cried and the eye care professional that I saw handed me a list of of places to contact and the first one was the league for the blind so when you when you see that word blind it, it kind of smacks you in the face at first you know and 
And that to me just indicated hopelessness and, and I didn't really know how to react. Um, but the funny thing was then years down the road, I ended up working at the league. So rather ironic. Yeah. How, how fortuitous. Yes. Um, and so at the time of diagnosis, were you given any information about genetic testing um, or, or maybe <clears throat> years later? And yeah. what has that experience been? Yeah, back then, uh, that was, um, that was about a few years ago. So genetic testing was still not something that people were familiar with, but um, I did become aware of it. I did some reading on it. Some information was presented to me about it. So um, I recently at a low vision exam had genetic testing done, awaiting those results and just waiting for the science to come about once they identify what genes cause mine, how they might be able to be treated. So it's exciting. Um, I, I say there's hope on the horizon. So just just waiting for those, those uh, cures to be found. And I know they will. Yeah, absolutely. And when you talk about it, it being exciting, I'm curious, what, what kind of helped you make that decision to do the genetic testing? What, what was on your mind? Um, just the fact that when it was available um, and, and just knowing that, you know, having it identified now, even though they haven't found a cure for that specific gene marker, um, knowing that it is, is already identified and once they find a cure, you know, then, then I can know that I would be eligible as a candidate for that treatment. Excellent. Can you describe what your vision is like today? Sure. So people a lot of times don't understand partially sighted, legally blind, fully blind. Um, so that makes it kind of hard for people. They look at me and they say, oh, you seem so normal, you know? Well, I am normal. All of my vision is just a little bit different. So I can see I don't drive anymore only because of, of that lack of being able to see things in my periphery. So somebody running, darting into a street or something like that. So um, I know that's one of the most difficult decisions I had to make. And I know a lot of people face that. Um, it's hard to give up what feels like that independence, but it's so much safer, not only for yourself, but everyone around you. So um, that was the most difficult thing. Um, having a good support network, though, makes that a lot easier. And knowing the resources around you, um, there all there's always an alternative way to do something. So, although it might be a little bit different, once you learn that, it, it still allows you to be independent and do your own thing. So, um, I I wear a headlight like the hikers wear when I am around my house. Um, that gives me just the right amount of lighting. Um, I, for a long time, did not go out at night because I was afraid of that. But um, now I'm starting to venture out a little bit more and feel more comfortable that way. Use my cane more as um, it kind of feels like sometimes the vision is decreasing. Um, but yeah, still good central vision. I work on a computer. I use high contrast settings and I have a number of adaptive technology tools that allow me to work full time. So wonderful. There, and you mentioned so many different resources that have helped you mm -hmm. maintain independence. Is there anything else that we didn't, um, that you didn't mention that you'd like to? Um, just describe as something that's been really helpful um, with uh, coping with RP? Just knowing the resources, just being familiar with those things. Um, technology is growing every day and I'm just fascinated by new developments and things that are available. Um, but I think that, you know, just just being informed of what's available. A lot of people don't know where to go. And so um, just knowing those contact people and those agencies that, that connect you, even if you just know a Center for Independent Living, 
can connect you to a number of different things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's so much of your your role right now at the mm -hmm. the center is connecting people to those resources. So yes, I'm sure yeah. you've seen the impact of of um, how resources really help. Yeah, it it gets a little emotional sometimes when people say oh, I've dealt with this for years. I didn't know that this was available. I wish I would have known about you sooner. Um, the huge tears and hope in their voice is amazing. So that's why I said I have the best job in the world. Mm -hmm. That's great. So uh, you are a recent graduate of the Aspect Patient Advocacy Program at Prevent Blindness. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience participating in that program? Yeah, that was life changing as well. Um, I, I didn't know what to expect when we came in and um, everything was so comfortable and I gained so much knowledge on the perspective of the healthcare providers, the eye professionals, um, how to tell my story, how to be effective in telling my story, um, connecting with uh local legislators. I had never talked to a representative in my life. So uh, just that having that experience to learn and, and realize that you're talking to people, they're just people too. So it made me more comfortable. Now I feel that I can approach them on an individual basis or um, connect with members of the cohort that I was in um, to make an impact. So and then the, the trip to Washington, that was, I had never been. So again, felt like once in a lifetime opportunity. That's wonderful. So, and, and finally, um, what do you want people to understand about RP or even vision impairments in general? Anything that you didn't touch on so far? Uh, I just, I just like to highlight that only 10% of the people who are considered legally blind have no vision at all. So it's important for people to know, even though someone's using a white cane, doesn't mean that they don't have any vision at all. And, and I've heard before, oh, she's faking or he's faking. That's not the case. So I always like to inform people of that. Um, you know, when you're interacting with someone who's vision impaired, approach them, ask them if they need help because they may need help and they may not. So um, just, just be in tune to what their responses are. And um, I think that's, you know, the most important thing, be supportive. Don't assume that people can't do things because of their vision loss. Um, let them explain how how things work best for them, what works for them, and then do your best to, to support them. Brenda, thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate your time.